And we're back. Well, let's see. The Koshi Gurzak theorem was talking about simple closed uh, simple closed contours so that a function is analytic on the contour and inside the contour, which means it only works on domains where we don't have holes. And so that is something that we want to formalize now, and it turns out to be pictorially quite easy and formally quite demanding, so we're going to stay mostly with the pictorial side of that issue, and essentially the two kinds of domains that are mentioned in this headline here are domains with and without holes. So, the cauchy gurzak theorem works as long as the function is analytic on the domain that contains the contour and the contour is interior, but at the same time we know that if C is the positively oriented unit circle, then the integral of Z to negative 1 along that thing is 2 pi i, which is not zero, so that shows that the result need not hold when the function is not analytic in the whole interior. Notice that z to negative 1 is analytic everywhere except at that one point, and that one point already ruins it. Um, as a side note, as we're also talking about the logic of things here, notice that if we're integrating z to the negative 2, which is also not analytic at the origin, well, that integral around the unit circle is zero, so that shows that just because the function is not analytic in the, in the whole interior does not mean that the theorem automatically fails. So this is quite common in mathematics and in life. If your hypotheses are satisfied, you can say something with confidence, with certainty. There, there's no question. But if the hypotheses are not satisfied, then really often it's anything goes, meaning if your hypotheses are not satisfied, it may work or it may not. Um, okay, so the problem with uh, z to negative 1 on the unit circle is apparently that the function is not analytic at z equals 0. And uh, pictorially what that means is that the domain has a hole at 0. And we want to formalize that idea. Basically, never mind that in some situations when there is a hole, things work out. That is something that is apparently extremely hard to formalize, if at all, because, I mean, what's the difference between z to negative 1 and z to negative 2? There isn't that much. Of course, there are two different functions, but in terms of shape of domain, analyticity, and the like, uh, there isn't much of a difference. So we're going to focus on how to deal with the holes. Um, and the definition is a domain D, and remember domains are connected, so that for every simple closed contour C in the domain, the interior of the contour is contained in D, is called simply connected. So that means something like this would be simply connected, because no matter what kind of a contour I stick inside of it, call it C, uh, the interior of that contour is also inside the domain. There is no way I can draw a curve here that somehow wraps around something that is not inside the domain, that is in something of the... Uh, that wraps around some points in the exterior of the domain. So simply connected simply means no holes. And the cauchy gurzat theorem then can be formulated as follows. If f is analytic on the simply connected domain D, then for any closed contour C in D, we have that the integral of f over C is equal to 0. So that's just the cauchy gurzat theorem for simple closed contours. And well, we still have to talk about contours that can self-intersect, but that's not that bad either, because contours that intersect themselves can be broken up into simple contours. Take something that just loops and intersects itself, but ultimately is closed. Well, that thing consists of this simple closed contour plus this simple closed contour plus the outside here. That's also a simple closed contour, and if you add all those integrals up, that's a bunch of zeros, and the total integral is also zero. So that is what, um, what happens here. Notice again, um, there's the formal side and the pictorial side. Pictorially, it's quite clear how to break these things up. And then uh, even formal people will say, yeah, that's clear, because even though it is a pain, yeah, we, we can take the parametrization of this overall contour and turn it into parametrizations of all those smaller contours. Okay, um, 
If f is analytic on the simply connected domain, so simply connected really is a piece of vocabulary that we want to have at this stage, it means it has no holes, but then f has an antiderivative, and that's because by the preceding theorem, integrals of f over closed contours are zero, and by the first theorem of this presentation, which was actually in the previous recording, we know that f must have an antiderivative, because that's what is implied when integrals over closed contours are zero. So that's actually quite quick, and we'll have a couple, not, couple more quick ones like that, I think. Um, so now the opposite, of course, is what happens when we're not simply connected, well, then we're multiply connected. And multiply connected just means that there must be a hole there, so there must be a contour, C, so that the domain D does not contain the whole interior of the contour. So I guess if I explain it that way, I should have first drawn the contour and then the whole, but I'd rather give first the whole domain. And basically what it means is multiply connected means there are holes in the domain, there are ways for curves in the domain to wrap around things that are not in the domain. And uh, well now if we have a positively oriented simple closed contour and we let C1 through Cn be pairwise disjoint clockwise that is negatively oriented simple, simple closed contours that are in the interior of this C. And if we let F be analytic in a possibly multiply connected domain that contains the contours and the region in, so it contains the contours C as well as C1 through Cn, and the region that is inside C and outside the Cj's, then the integral of f over c plus the sum of the integrals of f over the cj's is equal to zero. That feels terribly complicated, and it is if you want to parameterize it all, but if you draw the picture, the proof is actually quite quick. Here's our domain, and it may or may not have a hole. Here's the contour c, positively oriented. Here is another contour that I'll call c1 that is negatively oriented. And here's a point that probably is not in the domain, or, well, if it is or isn't, doesn't matter, but it's essentially the center point of this thing that is supposed to be like a circle. It didn't quite work out here. Um, and if we now want to prove that the integral of this thing plus the integral of this thing is equal to zero, well, our weapon that we have is the cauchy gursat theorem. And if the domain contains the interior of C except for um, some stuff that may be in the interior of these contours Cj, then in particular this domain, if we just work with one C1, then in particular this domain contains a connection from C to C1. And so what we do therefore is to be formally perfectly correct is we make a little cut in C1, we make a little cut in C and we identify those points and then just identify correspond uh, not identify connect corresponding points in such a way that what we end up with is one single contour as we can see here and now by the cauchy gursat theorem because this thing doesn't wrap around anything that is outside d because we've got this little slit here essentially the integral over this thing is equal to 0 and now we could simply make this gap smaller and smaller. And if we make this gap smaller, then of course this integral out here gets closer and closer to the integral over the whole contour C because this little part that is missing ultimately becomes negligible. Simply, similarly, the integral here becomes the integral around C1 because the part that's missing is negligible. And these two parts get closer and closer to each other. And as they get closer and closer to each other, of course the integral that goes one way is approximately the negative of the integral that goes the other way and in the limit that they are equal so that goes away and so that means we get that the integral of the outside contour plus the integral of the inside contour is over the inside contour is equal to zero. Okay now let's take two positively oriented simple closed contours so that C1 is contained in the interior of C2 and let F be analytic in a region that contains the contours and the region between them then the integrals of these simple closed contours are actually of, of f over these simple closed contours are actually equal and the proof is the same proof as the previous result 
same picture, it's just that this time the C on the outside, we may want to call that C2. Um, and remember for the previous result, the picture had as an example that we only had uh, one contour C1, but I could of course do the same trick with arbitrarily many uh, contours as long as they don't intersect each other. And even when they intersect, them, you can trick around that too. Okay, so except that because both contours are positively oriented, this time the difference of the two integrals is zero, and then we bring one of the integrals over to the other side. Okay, yeah. And as an example here now, the integral of z to the negative 1 around any positively oriented simple closed contour that has the origin in its interior is 2 pi i. Well, how is that? We have proved that the integral of this function along positively oriented circles around the origin is 2 pi i because that integral, okay, we have proved it maybe for the unit circle, but that computation scales for any positively oriented circle, actually. And therefore, the preceding theorem lets us go to arbitrary positively oriented simple closed contours that have the origin in their interior because we can always put a tiny circle into the contour's interior and then apply the previous theorem or draw a really large circle around it. And that, whoops, and that is it for now. Uh, basically what you want to do is you want to go carefully through the arguments. These arguments are um, quite difficult and certainly you're not expected to produce proofs like that right away but there may be some homework problems assigned that ask you to argue in similar ways to draw the kinds of pictures that we've drawn here in order to arrive at similar results and certainly also there will be some homework problems where you simply apply those theorems. The main thing here is that you become accustomed to this interplay of visual thinking and abstract reasoning that ultimately leads to very powerful results. Our next uh, order of business is to extend the cauchy gorsuch theorem into the Cauchy integral formula, which is then the centerpiece for proving a lot of rather amazing results about analytic functions. Until then.